Man, thank you for joining us for Church Online. And we're the Maple City Baptist Church, and we have been in the book of Jonah. And let me give you a little recap of last week. You know, we know that Jonah, God tells him to go preach to Nineveh. He rebels, goes completely opposite, right? He pays to get on this boat that he shouldn't have been on. He had to pay the price, and he ends up sleeping in the bottom of this boat, right? And so they're not very happy about it because all of a sudden God sends a wind. There's a great storm, and these guys are getting ready to die. So they come down and they address him, and you know they keep talking to him, like in verse 8, Jonah 1, 8. And they're basically saying to him, why in the world is God wanting to kill us um, just for something that you've done? You know, and so basically, at this point in the story, we see that this whole group of people in this boat are being punished for one man's sin. And what we start seeing now is a beautiful picture in this book of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because, you know, we know clearly that the Bible says in Romans chapter 5 that it was by one man that sin entered the world. So last week we seen how all these people in the boat was a picture of like everybody on planet Earth. And everybody is going down, man, in judgment because of sin. And it was all caused by one man. What's interesting is Jonah told him, hey, you guys throw me over and it'll all be good for you. And uh, so what was neat is Jonah picturing the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jonah was guilty, man. He was in rebellion. And we know that Jesus was not. But then Jesus took our sin upon himself. He became a sinner for you and me. He took our sins, even though um, he was not sin. The Bible said he had never committed a sin. He was absolutely perfect yet he chose the responsibility for us and so what's beautiful about this is Jonah told these guys well you need to throw me overboard and they didn't want to and so they finally they they end up crying out to the Lord and then they ended up doing the very thing they didn't want to and, and we learned a lesson last week and the lesson is this that you know the Bible says the wages of sin is death there's got to be a penalty there's got to be somebody paying a price for this sin and Jonah told these guys, you need to throw me overboard. And uh, they did not want to do that. Matter of fact, the Bible says they kept rowing and working harder and harder and harder, which is a perfect picture of you and me trying to work our way and to appease God's wrath, like to do something or to be a good person, try to be justified. And the Bible says there's only one way to be justified, and that's by the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and his resurrection. And so basically, Jonah told these guys, you need to throw me out, throw me under the bus. And gang, this is exactly what we need. We need to accept the Lord Jesus Christ, or there's no justification for our sin, and we'll pay a price for that. You know, something last week I thought was super interesting is in Jonah chapter 1, verse 12, he tells these guys, he says, hey, throw me into the water and this storm will cease, Right? throw me. Uh, God's after me. That's what's going on here. And what was interesting about this is, did you notice that Jonah, if he really knew this to be true, why didn't he just jump overboard? Well, he was in rebellion. He was running against God, but there's also a great principle here too. That is, the Bible says that Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world, but do you know that you and me have a responsibility to receive him? Like, they needed to lay their hands on Jonah and throw him over. They need to say, you, that's right, they're throwing him under the bus. You're the one. And so, this is exactly what we need to do with Jesus Christ. John 1.12 says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. So, just remember this, um, church, as we go out, that man, people have to make a choice here, Right? And even though Jesus died for the sins of the world, we have a responsibility of owning it and accepting it, right? And choosing Jesus Christ. And so, you know, we worked our way down through chapter one. We got clear down to the very end. And I want to pick up the last verse today. We're not going to get very far um, except this verse. You know, it says in verse 17, once Jonah was thrown overboard, it says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Let's pray over this verse that the Holy Spirit of God would teach us some good things. So, Holy Spirit of God, we are asking right now 
that you would speak to us. Take this passage, and even we're going to talk about some difficult things today, and just maybe, uh, Lord, unpack them for us. Um, we're, we're not very smart. These things are spiritually discerned. We need you to do it for us. So I pray that you would breathe life into this verse for us today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Okay, it says in Jonah 1.17, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Um, this is beautiful. Um, even though Jonah was going to get thrown overboard, the Bible says that the Lord was prepared. He prepared a great fish that was going to swallow up Jonah. Um, you know, I'd like to talk to you about the preparations of the Lord. You know, the Lord is prepared, man. You're never going to get one up on him, right? He is so prepared and he knows. We, The New Testament called this like his foreknowledge, man. He knows. And in the book of Jonah, we see here that God prepared a great fish to swallow him, which, you know, this is bad, right? I mean, he's in rebellion. They're going to cast him overboard, and God has this fish prepared, This, and it says a great fish, this large whale that's going to take him and, and, and eat him. So this is bad, but God prepared something bad and something big. When we get to chapter 4, there's three verses in a row that's going to say God prepared a gourd. That's small. Then God prepared a worm. That's also small. And then God comes in with a big wind, and God had prepared that also. So I guess uh, we just see, even just from the book of Jonah here, that God is very prepared. And notice it's not just with big things, even the little things. They matter. They really matter. And we need to know that a lot of these things are definitely from the Lord and not just the good things. You know, there's bad too. Uh, uh, the Bible is strong on reaping what we sow. There are consequences, man, for what we do. And that's what we're going to see here in this chapter that Jonah in his rebellion, man, God the Lord had prepared this great fish to swallow him up. You know, there's a verse in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11, and it says this, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. You know, we're created for God's glory, man, for his pleasure. Jonah was created for God's pleasure, for God's glory. And when he chose to go against God, all of a sudden he was going to be in trouble. He was no longer living for God's pleasure, but he was living for his own pleasure. And you know, the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow him, and we see this quite a bit in life too. And this is because men go contrary to God. We force God's hand in judgment. You know, and many a times in the Bible, like men will repent of their wickedness, and so God will repent. But listen, God's just and he is holy. And when men go contrary, and this is why, like Psalms 9 and verse 7 says, God's throne is prepared for judgment, man. Yeah, he's prepared. Yeah, don't, don't test him on this. Matthew 25, 11 says this, hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. God prepared hell for the devil and his angels. And since mankind has rebelled, the Bible makes it pretty clear that if men die in their sin and don't take Jesus Christ as their way out, that they will end up going to hell. Eventually, after judgment, end up being in a lake of fire. Consequences are real. And God's prepared. Uh, make no bones about it, man. God is so prepared. You know, there's a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It's pretty intense, actually. It talks about the church. It says when there's members in the church that are like in sin, like there's public sin and they, there's no repentance. They are in total rebellion against the Lord. You know, the Bible says that even as a church that we should give them over to Satan so that he, he could have his way with them. It'll destroy their lives and their flesh. Now, the, the point in doing that is like not to be mean. And the, the point in doing that is so that they could repent and that they could get right. And so here you see Jonah was going to run from God in rebellion. And so the Lord says, okay, 
then there's a great fish prepared to swallow you up, man. And this is just so true. Uh, man, I, and we just see this over and over in God's word and then in life is that God has no trouble preparing bad things and big fish to come swallow people up when men decide to go contrary to him. But let me tell you this. Our God is a God of reconciliation, right? He's a God that he's all for people. So just to let you know that, God's preparations are for first and foremost for people. The Bible even says that God wants us to prepare our hearts, and it says he'll even work to prepare our hearts to know him, to meet him. 1 Corinthians 2.9, it says, you, you can't even imagine the things that God has prepared for those that love him. See, when you love God and he wants you to be right with him, this is why he sent Jesus Christ, right? God made all the preparations in place so that we could have a relationship with him. And then also to, to let you know that once you enter the New Testament, the Bible says, Jesus says that he's going to prepare a place for us. God's a prepared God, man. I'm telling you, he wants to prepare a place for you. The book of Hebrews says there's a prepared city in the heavens. Um, uh, for us. And so we see this clearly, especially in the New Testament, that God is preparing a place. God will do all the preparations for you and me to know him. So God's all about people and he's all about places, the right ones. But we want to go and rebellion against God. And I just want you to know that he's also prepared to do what he must. And just like with Jonah, he was prepared and he prepared a great fish to swallow him up. Was this the Lord's choice or was it Jonah's choice? See, Jonah forced his hand. Just like we're going to see when Nineveh decides to repent, the judgment God said he was going to bring upon them, God turned from it. You see how that works? You know, just uh, when it comes to preparation, um, I, I think, I mean, you, you need to know that like, you know, in the Old Testament, they would like, I think of Moses in Exodus 15, he prepared a, a, a habitation for God. They were always had a tabernacle. They always wanted to prepare and build a temple for God to come down and meet with his people, you know. Um, we even see in First Chronicles chapter 15, right at the very beginning, that they were preparing a place for the ark of the Lord, like for the presence of the Lord in the Old Testament. I like how in the New Testament, God sent Jesus Christ and says, I I'm preparing a place for you. That I I I'm going to do the work here. I'm a prepared God, and I'm going to prepare people and their hearts to come to me, and I'm going to prepare an eternal place for you. So I know this story, Jonah 117, we see a little bit negative here, but this was Jonah's choice. We always had a phrase in our house we used with our children, and that is we always used to say, um, if you choose to sin, then you choose to suffer. So then I would just have them finish it. When they would do something wrong, my girls, I would just say, oh my gosh, since you chose to sin, what's that mean? And they would say, then we choose to suffer. This was Jonah's choice here. And so just to encourage you in the area of preparation, the majority of times that we are supposed to be prepared in the Bible, you know what it says? That we should prepare our hearts to seek the Lord. That's right. Be prepared. Prepare your hearts to seek the Lord. That's the preparation we need to do, you and me. And as Christians, if we do that preparation to seek the Lord, then the Bible says we should go proclaim to other people that they need to prepare the way of the Lord. They need to get prepared. You know, like Ephesians 6 15, we should have our feet shod with what? The preparation of the gospel of peace. We take that message to the nations that God wants a relationship with them, right? But first of all, we prepare our heart to seek the Lord. And when we do that preparation, have our hearts right, therefore, we want to take the good news of, of the gospel to the rest of the world, right? So that we can be prepared for the master's use. He wants to use us. Remember how we started this thing off? Revelation 4.11. Me, you, we were created for God's pleasure, right? And so just make sure we prepare our hearts to seek him, and then we'll be prepared with our feet shod to go give the gospel of peace to the rest. Of the world. We'll prepare. We'll tell people, prepare the way of the Lord, man. Prepare yourself for Jesus Christ. See, Jonah, he wasn't prepared to seek the Lord. 
He had obviously quit doing this. Something was wrong with him and the Lord because when the Lord said, hey, I need you as my prophet to go preach to Nineveh, Jonah said, not me, man. I do not want to do that. And when our relationship with God is not correct, we are not going to have any concern for other people, right? And this is what we see here. So just to start this verse off in Jonah 117, the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. It's sad. And folks, don't test him. Don't test him. God's a prepared God, and he's very ready to execute. And, and, and he executes violently, man. I mean, he wanted to rescue us so bad he gave a son for us, right? He's willing to do anything. We prepared for God. Uh, we prayed and said, God, please get our daughter's heart, whatever it takes. Boy, that was a big prayer because you know what happened. Our family had to deal with leukemia. It was a lot of suffering in our household. And God was so willing to do that to get her where she needed to be. So the Lord had prepared, notice it says he prepared a great fish. Man, if you read commentators and you read books on this, it's amazing to me the people that want to talk about this, like argue about this great fish, you know. Um, what was this great fish? And, uh, you know, people, all kinds of silliness. But I just simply believe the Bible. I don't know about you. But we got this story here in Jonah, and it says that he prepared a great fish to swallow him. Well, if you take your Bibles and go over to Matthew chapter 12, when Jesus Christ quotes this story in Matthew chapter 12, he says down in verse 40, he says this, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Notice this says three days and three nights, not in the great fish's belly, but it uses the word whale. This was very obvious, um, a whale. If you look up in Jonah what the great fish means, well, a great fish is a great, a very large fish. You get to Matthew 12 here in verse 40, it says it was a whale. You look up the definition of a whale here, and it actually is something a little different, like its own species. Um, it even uses a phrase like in its definition of like a, a sea monster. Well, this led me on a search. You know, I just wanted to find out what this was about. So I, I better look up every time you see fish in the Bible. I better look up every time you see whales in the Bible. Of course, that led me to Genesis 1, 21. And if you want to look there, this is kind of very unusual because as, as the creation is taking place, it gets down to Genesis chapter chapter 1 and verse 20. And it says, And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creatures that hath life, and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of the heaven. And then God created whales, and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. So now all of a sudden, God decides to specifically list uh, a, a species of of, of create of, of a created animal and it says god created great whales <laughs> he lists whales specifically well if you start investigating and looking up the definition of a whale it also uses the same as matthew 12 a sea monster if you take that hebrew word and plug it in to your computer, and you'll find out that that word, for God created great whales, is translated several different ways. And it's very unusual, but in Exodus chapter 7, when Moses was going to deliver God's people, and he had a rod, and God said to cast it down, and it said the rod became, it turned into a serpent. Same translation as the, as the word whale in Genesis chapter 1. Like a sea serpent. Hmm. You know, when you go to Deuteronomy chapter 32, in and, and, and Deuteronomy 32, it says in verse 33, it, it says, um, Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 33, um, well, look at verse 31. For their rock is not as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is the vine of Sodom and the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons 
and the cruel venom of asps. Now we find the word dragon, same word translated whale in Genesis 1 and verse 21. This is very unusual. So here they're singing the song of Moses and it's talking about their wine was just the poison of dragons. Yet this term is used quite a bit in the Bible. Psalm 74, 13, he talks about breaking the heads of dragons in the waters. And then he even says he'll break the heads of Leviathan. It gives a name to the dragon. Isn't that crazy? Did you know the greatest chapter in the Old Testament on Satan is probably Job 41? And it starts off and says, can you draw out Leviathan with a hook? Like, you think you're just going to play with this thing? It's the dragon, Leviathan. And if you want to take your Bibles, I know we're doing a lot of flipping, man, but this is pretty important because I think something's being taught here. Isaiah chapter 27 and verse 1, Isaiah 27, 1 says, And in that day the Lord with the sore and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. A dragon that's in the sea. Notice in Genesis, God created in the sea a great whale. And all of a sudden we find here in Jonah, God prepared this great fish. Or Matthew 12 says, a whale to swallow Jonah up. My friends, this great fish, this whale, is a picture of Satan of the dragon. That's why it's translated. With just a little bit of study, you'll run into the word dragon over and over and over again um, in the Bible. I would like to take you to Revelation chapter 12 to show you something. And this is uh, interesting because in Revelation chapter 12, it says in verse 1, there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, upon her head a crown of 12 stars. She being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and 10 horns and seven crowns upon his head. So now we got a great red dragon. It says in verse four, his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven. Wow. You know who we're talking about here? This dragon, this Leviathan that we see throughout the Bible, this dragon, this sea serpent, that's in the deep waters, as the Bible describes it. His tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven. Now we start learning, this, is, this was Lucifer, man. This was Satan up in heaven. And of course, we know that he took a third of the angels with him. He drew these. His tail drew a third part of the stars. And if you just keep reading here, it, it talks about a, his tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven and did cast him to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth the man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. So this lady's getting her to give up birth and there's a dragon ready to devour this child. And you can see, man, you know, this lady who she pictures and all of a sudden this dragon is going to try to devour the child. And we see just a beautiful picture, of course, you know, the nation of Israel bringing Jesus Christ into the world. And we've seen how the enemy did everything he could to try to destroy this child. But I want you to head down towards the end of this. Look, well, look at verse 9 in Revelation 12. 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angel were cast out with him. So notice the title given. Uh, so what we got is when the great whales were created, um, we, we've seen that that can be translated also serpents or dragons um, in, in the Bible. And so we see this great red dragon, and, and, and it says, you know, his tail drew a third part of the stars. We start figuring out who this is, but it gave him the title of the devil or the serpent, and remember even in Genesis when Adam and Eve's in the garden? I mean, who shows up? Oh, a serpent. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, you know, everybody's terrified of snakes, aren't they? And isn't this crazy? I mean, we don't like to think of these type of things, but, you know, we're not terribly far removed. You ever go to a museum and, like, see a dinosaur, 
you know, bones and all these skeletons put together. It's wild, isn't it? You look at these big, like, creatures. And you're, my gosh, these, like, massive dragon-like creatures. Yeah, and what about uh, if you study the stars? Um, Greek mythology, D Draco, you know, this great dragon. You'll see it in the constellations. It's supposedly, like, you know, Greek mythology, like Hercules comes along and slays the dragon. There's always this massive, gargantuous enemy. And the problem is, we've kind of treated it like a fairy tale. And so it messes us up a little bit. And I think it started off years ago with just watching the movies. You remember Godzilla? You know, it comes along and, and just think about it. Uh, I mean, Narnia, the movie Dragon Hunters, Dragon Heart, the Game of Thrones that got real popular, that came along, and these incredible dragon-like creatures, the Reign of Fire, Lord of the Rings, Maleficent, Aragon, Dungeons and Dragons. And then it starts getting soft on us. It's like the enemy knows, you know, even though we see in Job 41, it mentions Leviathan. It says, man, can you just tinker and toy with this thing? And it says, no way, man. This is the enemy. This is the devil. And then cute movies come out like How to Train a Dragon. When I was a kid, it would have been things like Pete's Dragon, you know, some big old overweight dragon that we can like become friends with. The Never Ending Story, A Quest for Camelot, The Water Horse, Puff the Magic Dragon, all, all these things. But I think our culture and history has shown that it will ease us into, into what is actually wrong. And, um, and guys, there's just an infatuation with this in the arts. The movie theaters are just filled with movies of Jurassic Park and Megalodon, uh, w w the Loch Ness Monster, always something in the, you know, Creature from the Black Lagoon would be an old one. And then it gets silly, you know, Dino Shark and all these massive dinosaurs. They make all these beings, but I'll tell you what it is. You know, you think people are just sitting around making this stuff up, or is it based upon some reality? I think it's based upon some reality. I think that's exactly what happens. And before you know it, it gets accepted. And like, we really believe that like dragon-like creatures are, are going to be our friends. And before you know it, it'll be like the Bible. We'll be worshiping those things. So, you know, Revelation 20 in verse 2, it talks about the dragon, the old serpent, the devil. And it says that God binds him for a thousand years. And then he comes back up to life and in, in verse 10, then it just says he's cast into the lake of fire forever and ever. So just want you to know, God prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. This great fish is a picture of the dragon. I think it's a picture of Leviathan in the Bible. And I think it's a picture of, of the devil. And what's beautiful about this is God is so big and massive and so prepared. He'll even use the devil for his glory. He'll allow the devil. And that's why the Bible even says in 1 Corinthians 5, we can even give people over to Satan. If they want to live a sinful life, and they, they can return back to their original daddy, right? In John chapter 8, their father, the devil. And uh, anyways, I know it's kind of weird to talk about these things and look at them. It's kind of like talking about dinosaurs and things. It just seems so ridiculous, doesn't it? And then if you start studying this, you're going to learn, we'll see this next week a little bit, in outer space. You know, we'd like to take space ships because the Bible says there's a whole body of water up above, not just what's on earth, the majority of planet earth and how deep it goes down. There's a depth that ends up at the throne of God clear up in the north. There's a body of water where that Leviathan, that's why you can look up and study the stars. And, like, and that right there is Draco. See that dragon? And you'll see different pictures. And some people think that and believe you can like You'll see the gospel up in the stars. And man, there's a lot of truth to a lot of that stuff. So, hey, let, let's keep going here. It says in verse 17, the Lord prepared a great fish, but to swallow up Jonah. I like that swallow up because that word means to engulf, right? To devour. To It's like being really hungry, man. And you sit down with a plate of food and you're just going to swallow it. You're going to devour it. And this is exactly what was going to happen with Jonah. God prepared a great fish and it was going to swallow him up. Now, Jonah was in rebellion, right? And so now we got a picture of like the enemy just going to devour him. And gang, here's the principle. The principle is if we want to devour sin, then sin's going to devour us. You really want to feed your little baby dragon and train it? 
Why don't you go get a Komodo dragon and put it in your bedroom and keep it as a pet? And I don't know how long you're going to live, but it ain't going to take too long. And that thing is going to take over and devour your life. This is exactly what happens. And the Bible says this. We got to be careful of this, right? But you know, the Lord, you want to provoke the Lord? You know what it says? The Bible says he'll devour you. He will swallow you up. Remember Korah in the Old Testament in number 16? God opened up the whole earth and a bunch of people were swallowed up. Yeah, God will swallow you up in his wrath. Do not play with him. He literally prepared this great fish to swallow up Jonah. This is the route you want to take. Now, practically, let me give you a, a Psalms 107, verse 27. It says, like a drunken man, they were at their wit's end. That phrase, wit's end, is the same phrase for swallow up. So it's like a man that starts drinking, and then he starts drinking too much, and before you know it, he's devouring alcohol, but now alcohol is devouring him, and he's at his wit's end. See, it swallowed him up. Sin does that to us. I hope today that some of you listening might say, I am at my wit's end. Like, I'm tired of it, man. The enemy has just swallowed me up, man. Sin has just devoured me. And the Bible says in Proverbs 19 that the wicked devour iniquity. They devour it, man. You you just swallow it right up and you take it down as deep as you can, right? Remember, 1 Peter 5, 8, the Bible says the devil is walking about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's wanting to devour our lives up, man. And we got to be aware of this, man. We do not want to be in rebellion against God because God is prepared. He's prepared to do whatever it takes and he is not going to tolerate sin. That's why when Jesus was on the cross and took our sin, Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, he, he forsook his own son because he took my sin, took your sin. God doesn't look upon sin. He's a just and a holy God. So just remember here in verse 17, the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Remember that great fish, it pictures a, a picture of Leviathan, the dragon, the devil himself. It says, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Jonah was in the belly of the fish. Now, if you look down in Jonah chapter 2 and verse 2, it says, Jonah cried out from the belly of hell. Isn't that awesome how God shows us this? Because he's crying out of the belly of this whale. And Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40 says that Jesus Christ it says, just like Jonah was in the whale's belly, it says, so Jesus Christ will be uh, in the heart of the earth for, uh, you know, for, for three days. The heart of the earth. The heart of the earth, that's the belly of hell, man. The center of the earth is where hell is at. Did you know that? The Bible actually says in Luke 16, when that rich man of Lazarus, he died, went down, and, in the, and there they are in the center of the earth. It says, and there was Lazarus in Abraham's bosom, and then there was the rich man in hell. So picture the planet earth, and so this great, you know, as the earth revolves and rotates, that's basically like you got a bottomless pit. It feels bottomless because it's always moving. You're never going to hit the bottom. But in the center, there's Abraham's bosom. What's Abraham's bosom? But it's a place where the, the faithful of the Old Testament went. Because nobody gets to heaven without being perfect. The only way to get to heaven is the perfect one, Jesus Christ, dies for our sins. That didn't happen. So the Old Testament saints were in a holding tank called Abraham's bosom. Kind of a cool doctrine. On the other side was hell, right? That's, that's what it says in, in Luke 16, 22 through verse 23. And then when Jesus Christ died for the sins of mankind, it says in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 and 19, like, he goes down, and when he died, he goes to the center of the earth, and it says he preached to the spirits in prison. So, just like Jonah, we're going to see next week, he's swallowed up by this whale, and it swam deep, deep down. Picture of Jesus Christ taking hell, taking our sin, taking hell for you and me. But we see here that Jesus Christ ended up, after the three days, he preached to the spirits in prison, emptied Abraham's bosom, and then came up to planet earth again. It's a beautiful story. We'll look a little closer at that next week. But this belly of the fish is the belly of hell, man. It's the center of the earth, exactly what Jesus Christ did for you and me. And then, you know, it says, 
uh, it says that he was in the belly of this fish three days and three nights. Of course, you know, Jesus Christ says in uh, John 2, 19 through 20, he just says, hey, if you destroy this temple, he said, uh, it'll be raised in three days. Of course, they changed his wording, didn't they? They made it like, oh, what do you mean? Uh, you're going to build this temple? It took years to build this. No, he said raised. It'll be supernaturally resurrected, right? And in Mark 8, he says, you know, they're going to kill me, but three days later, I'm coming back to life. So just like we see Jonah, he's in the belly of the whale. He goes through an awful death and goes down to the center you know, of the earth in the belly of hell. It's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ dying for you and me and going to hell. And yet Matthew 12 and verse 40 says, As Jesus was three days in the heart of the earth, we know that he resurrected from the grave, right? He died, resurrected from the grave, came back to life. Jonah's going to do the same thing, and we're going to see it next week. After this awful death, he goes through a talking time with the Lord, and he gets resurrected again. So, man, I'd like to end this message with how we started it off. Remember these men? They had to cast Jonah out into the sea. Jonah didn't jump himself. They had to receive him and grab Jonah and throw him over, and then the storm ceased, right? This is what we need to do. My question is, do you know Jesus today, man? I hope you do. And just remember this, today, verse 17, the Lord prepared a great fish. God's a very prepared God. He'll do whatever it takes, right? He's prepared. If we prepare ourselves to seek the Lord, then we'll be prepared with the gospel of peace. We'll go places, right? Jonah wasn't willing to do that, but our God's prepared. And he'll act on, uh, on consequences of the decisions we make. He prepared a great fish, which pictures what? We've seen today what it pictures. This whale, man, it pictures like Leviathan, the devil. This thing was going to devour. That's right. This is the devil's domain, man. It's a picture of the belly of hell, man. He was in the belly, right? Swallowed up Jonah. Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope you know him today. I hope you're enjoying the study on Jonah. I can't wait to see you next week. We'll pick it up. We are the Maple City Baptist Church. Thanks for joining us for Church Online. I hope you enjoy the series on the book of Jonah. The newest message drops every Saturday night at 7. If you like what you're hearing, there's more. We're on several social media platforms. Links are in the description below. Thanks again for watching.